Welcome to the Positive Impact Podcast, where we dive into the world of movers, shakers, and change makers, creating a positive impact on the world. This is your host, Alexandra Black Pollock, and together we're going to tackle real issues, discovering how we can make the world a better place. This episode is brought to you by HelloFresh. Tired of the grocery store? Looking to spice up dinners? HelloFresh delivers delicious ingredients and easy recipes straight to your door. Take $40 off your first box at positiveimpactpodcast.com slash fresh. You'll be enjoying cooking again in no time. Today I have the rare treat to be joined by Alicia Wallace, the co-founder, chief operating officer, and one of the visionaries behind All Across Africa. This incredible mission-driven business employs over 3,000 people in rural Africa, empowering them through commerce. Redefining the negative stereotype both around millennials and business, Alicia is spearheading this purposeful, certified B Corp at the age of 29. Alicia, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here to talk to you more. You have such an incredible story and the impact that you're doing is just phenomenal. But can you start with how you go from getting an economics degree from Seattle Pacific University to co-founding and being the chief operating officer at a company that impacts people in Africa? So I will shorten my story. Obviously, it's quite a lengthy one, but just in brief, um, it started with I wanted to go into business. I wanted to do something. um, I have a strong drive for leadership and always have. And so I knew that I wanted to lead something and to inspire others. And I thought that that would just be through regular business, a normal business channel. And when I was in college, I had the opportunity to go to Africa on a medical mission. Had nothing to do with the actual medical field. Um, I was there supporting doctors and nurses, checking patients in. And it was there where um, babies died in our arms on the way to hospitals. And I just saw the lack of opportunity and the desire for um, dignified work. Um, As much as I enjoyed the medical clinic and thought that we were bringing a solution, to me, it didn't feel like a sustainable solution. It didn't feel like they could replicate that after we were gone and that something um, had made a lasting impact other than possibly solving typhoid at that moment or malaria, but it wasn't long-term. And so when I came back, it was a burden on my heart. I knew that I couldn't go and work for the financial firms that I had sought out or Microsoft or Boeing in Seattle where I thought that I would one day work. Um, I knew that I had to find some way to impact the world and to make an impact specifically on Africa that had such a significant significant um, and powerful impact on my life. So that's the beginning. (laughs) This is incredible. So your first time going to Africa, as you mentioned, was on a medical mission. As you were building this business in Africa, what kind of learning curves did you have with the culture there or learning how to even bring a business? So it started, the next connection was um, when I was in Seattle um, after university and even during university, kind of seeking out partners and opportunities. Who did I believe in the work that they were doing? Um, I met someone who was leading a nonprofit and the nonprofit was called Rwanda Partners, doing work in East Africa, focused on education, reconciliation, and job creation. And as a small grassroots organization, to have those three focuses, it was overwhelming. So when I started to volunteer there and get in, I said, how can we drive a specific focus? And actually what it turned into be was a job um, and it sent me to Rwanda um, and we just so happened to have an order with Macy's at the time. And so having those three focuses and having that order with Macy's allowed me the opportunity and the lens to say, like, can job creation actually solve education and reconciliation that we were actually fundraising and working to solve? And so that's really what inspired the the business and the nonprofit was we we still were doing all of it. We had these three focuses. Um, someone had already, you know, Greg, my now business partner, but who was leading the nonprofit, had already been doing work in Rwanda. And so it was that connection. It was um, networking, making connections, and actually going and starting to see what works. When you talk about this order from Macy's, what exactly was Macy's ordering, and how had that come to fruition? They were ordering baskets for their home store and it came to fruition from actually, you know, creating baskets and bringing them to market ourselves. They had a partner that was delivering on basket orders at the time and the partner wasn't able to execute um, and deliver their product on time. And so the, the company that had the order from Macy's came to us and said, look, I'm sure you view us as a competitor, but we want a partner and we want you to be able to help us keep this Macy's account and to be able to deliver and execute on time. So that's what it was about is the actual operational um, efficiencies that we could create on the ground to keep this market open. And thus a business is born. Yes. 
Baskets play a very unique role in a lot of African culture. In the recent interview with Conscious Company Magazine, you talked about how baskets were kind of a dying breed, but you guys were able to turn what was viewed into a dying enterprise into a thriving one. Can you kind of touch on navigating that? Yeah, I think that um, if you were to mention African baskets to a common um, American consumer, they are not going to envision it to be a desirable product that they want to decorate their homes with. And so for us, reviving it meant getting designers from the U.S. involved, people who are working in Brooklyn and um, have a talent and are also designing for West Elm and Macy's and Bed Bath & Beyond who know market trends, who can forecast and who can compete um, to actually partnering with us and designing for our artisans to make a competitive product. So now you have a unique blend. You have American designers from New York and all around that are now partnering with African artisans. I can imagine that there were some maybe challenges there in either blending the cultures or taking what is a unique part of a culture and then commercializing it. Did you run into hesitancies? Were there certain things that needed to be addressed or kind of basically taught to either the designers or the artisans? Definitely. There's definitely a learning curve for the designers and both the technical capacity, how um, far can they actually take the design and the quality, um, and then also just in being culturally sensitive. So the designers still want to create new things, but they also want to um, tell a story about Rwanda. They want to tell a story about the cultures they're designing. So um, taking the time to research, to understand from the artisans, um, what are significant patterns and meanings and colors to them, and how can we communicate their story? One of the fundamental ways that we were able to actually execute that bridge between artisans and uh, our designer teams um, are through our fantastic leadership teams on the ground. And it comes down to having really phenomenal local leaders who know the culture, who are from Rwanda or from Burundi or from Uganda, who can actually communicate with our artisans, but at the same time have a university education or some sort of work experience that connects them to the Western world to know operations and communication and effectively bridge that gap. I really want to dig into this idea of cultural sensitivity and storytelling. But first, I think this is a great opportunity to kind of explain all across Africa and what it is that you guys specifically do and a little bit of the inner workings. Sure. So our goal and our focus is to create jobs for marginalized men and women across Africa. And that, at the end of the day, does not specifically have to mean crafts, um, doesn't have to mean baskets, but we've seen it as the best method to actually lifting up poor rural farmers who have no education and very little natural uh, material access. And so, yeah, what I mean, our, our whole focus is how do we lift them up where they don't need charity or aid anymore, um, where they have um, dignity in their work, um, and how do we empower them to have an impact long after? How do we teach them skills, um, and how can they save their money that's diversifying their income to lift themselves even further out of poverty than we just did by a market connection? You touched on this term twice, and it's dignified. And it's such a unique concept because a lot of times people go in and they have their ideas and their visions and they go into a culture that sometimes they don't know anything about. And I think that could, looking from a personal perspective, I could see that being very undignified. But this is something that obviously has resonated a lot with you. Can you kind of touch on that and why it plays such an important role? Yeah, I think dignified work plays an important role for me because we think of the poor um, sometimes for just being a candid word, maybe lazy or unskilled or um, unable. Um, and the truth is, is it's just a lack of um, education and ability and opportunity. And so when you're able to open those doors, um, the dignified work comes from pride that we make beautiful things that people are proud of as well. So our artisans are beaming with joy when they accomplish a basket that a New York designer made and that they know that American person is going to appreciate. That connects them to that greater purpose as well, saying like, I am worthy, like I can accomplish something and I can do something to be proud of myself. In a way, you're almost spreading dignity through a lot of areas that are very poverty stricken. How does that impact an entire community when you're able to put that into the core of what they're doing? 
Yeah, that sense of confidence radiates throughout their community. So when they have confidence in their skill, um, it's likely that they're going to want to tell their neighbor like, hey, I'm doing this and I can accomplish this. Do you want to learn too? Or let me teach you. Um, They're also able to employ other people. They're proud. They're saying, hey, I'm making 10 times more than I would laboring in a field today. I don't get to go dig in my field for vegetables for my family. Can I pay you? to go and do my work. And so that dignity like radiates, it creates other jobs, they're proud, they become leaders in their community, Um, they want to encourage and lead other people. Um, And so, yeah, it just has this ripple effect down to creating more income for other people, it's reinvested. And just that sense of confidence of like, there's hope for something, we can all work towards something, there is a better future that exists. That's almost a defining element between charity and really empowering people through commerce. And that's one of the things I'm most impressed with all across Africa is you guys took a very unique stance and you said, we are not charity. We are very specifically empowerment and we have our targeted focuses. And as you mentioned, yes, it has a ripple effect. But let's talk about how far that ripple effect has reached because you guys are actually serving a lot of areas in Africa. Yeah, we are. So we started in Rwanda with basket weaving. And since then, we've reached out. We work in Uganda as well with four different cooperatives, about 120 people. And we also work in Burundi. The interesting thing about Burundi is we talk about dignified work and the lack of charity. Is Burundi has no craft um, or traditional um, heritage that's being passed on. So when we walk into a country like Burundi and we want to actually create jobs and replicate what we've been doing successfully in Rwanda um, in a war-torn country like Burundi, it actually does require aspects of charity. So we do have partners like the UN who are saying, How do we bring back any craft and any skills? So taking people from the ground, returning refugees, youth in the north, how do we bring them from the ground up and give them a skill that then the business is actually able to come in and design and invest and take them to the next level of bringing their crafts to market? So we've gone from the nonprofit charity aspect to just dignified work to seeing that only dignified work doesn't always mean it can be replicated everywhere, that some of the most needy populations still do need charity, but with that focus and that mindset of becoming sustainable businesses. There's a purpose, there's a timeline, we measure it, we're accountable to it. It's not just unending, we have to support these people and send their kids to school. They know what's coming and they're being trained for that business opportunity. Something that's been a trend throughout other episodes is this idea of partnership and really leveraging partnerships to further expand your growth. And it sounds like you're partnering with organizations like the UN, and I'm sure you have to have local partnerships, especially in these very challenging countries. Like you mentioned, they're very, they can be war torn. There's very dynamic histories there. Can you touch on the role of partnerships in fueling your business? Yeah, partnerships have been fundamental. Um, We've partnered with business leaders um, in Rwanda, Uganda, and Burundi, um, almost as advisors. So people who might not necessarily leave the business world, they potentially are making more money for their family or don't have an interest, but have a value to navigating how to manage business and accounting and all those things that make a business tick. Um, So we have partnered with them. We've partnered with other organizations that continue to connect us to the community. So schools that are um, equipping street kids. We are still supporting and funding those schools. Those are still integral to our partnership. There is no way that we're going to be able to employ a street kid to produce crafts to pay for his education. There is still a need to support. And so we have fundamental partners in those ways as well. And the UN has been fundamental to um, being able to reach populations that we as a business could not fund and sustain um, in that level of training from bringing them up. And so they have um, offered a network of resources, other organizations, trainings um, that wouldn't otherwise be available to us. How important have local partnerships been, both in navigating some of the history cultural sensitivity, or just understanding how you can better serve these populations? You know, I would say partnerships in our very, very um, inception, so early on understanding Rwanda, were absolutely fundamental. 
Um, now that my business partner has 11 years of working in Rwanda, so a history of 11 years, and I personally have been working there for five, um, the personal partnerships that we have, so the trusted mentors and advisors that we know have our best interest in mind, um, those relationships have been fundamental. It's less about the organizations now and more about the individual relationships because organizations have their own agendas as well. Organizations still have their own efficiencies, their own measurables. So to take the time and to help us navigate um, export or a cultural issue or a production issue or a conflict, um, they're not always readily available for those calls. So um, it really comes down to having the strong leadership and the people that we know and trust that we could trust with our personal savings accounts and know that they were going to take them, take care of them. Those are kind of the relationships that we've built over time and that have been fundamental even now to navigating those cultural issues. One of the things that I see in all across Africa, and correct me if this is wrong, but it seems like you have a very intent purpose of preserving the culture there. And while you are bringing in some Western influence, you're really dedicated to that. And I can imagine that these personal relationships, both with the artisans and other locals, has been really instrumental in that. Is that right? Am I on the right track? You are, yeah. Definitely uh, preserving the culture as much as possible. Um, we work to, you know, read through um, design books or go to the museums and get inspiration from their basketry or their patterns and designs that they've made. Um, the unfortunate part about Africa is there isn't a ton of history and recordings of traditional crafts. So a lot of it is um, storytelling and asking them to draw out stories and meanings. And many people have different perceptions of what those mean. Um, but as much as possible, we are working to communicate their message. And a lot of those messages that resonate even stronger than the messages that we have here and the cultural meanings that we have here, what's different, what we communicate all day long is unity, friendship, hope. Those are things that I feel like are very much lacking in our American culture. And when you go to a continent like Africa, any of the countries there, there is like a lifeblood, like you feel that hope, you see deep friendships. Um, even in Rwanda, a war-torn country where neighbors killed their other neighbors, like it is a unified country now. Like what does it mean for America to live in unity? I'm not saying all of Rwanda's problems are gone. There are definitely still um, um, underlying division, but unity is a really strong message that Rwanda gets to create and to share with us. So those are the things that we're also looking to communicate. You guys have really brought those alive through your designs. I mean, even looking through your baskets, you have baskets that are under the unity brand, under the friendship it's been a really unique element to just watch those come alive through your baskets. How do you find that, you know, Western culture responds to those or, you know, even just through purchasing when they get to bring those stories to life and bring those values to their home? Yeah, I would definitely say that some people buy our baskets because they love the design, they love the color, and they're just going to purchase them anyways. Um, they might not take the time to learn this story. I'd say there's another third that purchases it because they feel connected to a person on the other end. And then another third is purchasing the basket because they're going to communicate a message of friendship to their friend that is struggling with cancer. And they're going to visit them and say, you know what? People in Rwanda have overcome this. I love you. Here's a token of my love and my friendship. And I was thoughtful in this purchase. We, we don't get gifts that stand for things like that, that have that meaning. And so it's a very powerful message. It is a strong distinguisher and being able to share that message and that story. It's not just a product saying, I'm purchasing something to help someone. It's saying, I'm going to share a piece of Rwanda with you. Such incredible, compelling stories on both sides of your product. I mean, the ability to create an organization that not only has stories that are from the artisans, but to share a basket with a friend who has cancer and saying, I want to empower you as you struggle through life is just awe-inspiring. So the next thing I want to touch on are what are some of the biggest misconceptions that um, people have about these areas in Africa? I think the biggest misconceptions are, um, you know, danger, fear that we feel 
Um, we have had a lot of media um, broadcast to us around Sudan and the starvation and the war that has gone on there, around Somalia, um, around Nigeria and the girls. Um, very rarely does the news um, pick up on the tidbits of hope. You know, I'm, I'm sure we've all seen the stories on Oprah or otherwise. So every here and there do we see those stories of hope and um, overcoming obstacles. But the common misperceptions are that it's a dark, scary continent. Um, and I, it, it's my second home and I wish it was my first, but being born in America and my family here and also leading a business here, um, this is my first home. But it is Rwanda, Burundi, Uganda are luscious landscapes. They are green. They are beautiful. They are mountainous. Um, the people are wonderful. It is, it's a safe and beautiful place to travel and to get to meet people. What was your biggest surprise about those countries when you went over there for the first time? You know, I think the biggest surprise for me was actually the obstacles as a young woman that I had to overcome. Um, here in the U.S., we have so many obstacles already to establish ourselves, especially as a 20-something-year-old business owner, um, you know, whatever discriminating factors that we feel like, you know, glass ceilings that are in place here in the U.S., um, they're really... Um, what I feel like is nothing compared to entering into African culture. And so working with um, a male dominated office when I arrived in Rwanda and working to accomplish um, a goal towards accomplishing an order for Macy's, um, seeing all of the roadblocks that were created by um, in some ways our own staff because of the lack of trust with like a, a young female coming in. Um, those were obstacles that over time I had to learn how to overcome, um, how to um, lead from below and not come in and um, put my um, ideas first or to suggest something. It was subtle ways of asking questions, not even directly, very subtly, um, and learning how to lead within their culture um, to accomplish the results that we needed. And so that was what was most surprising. I had been to Africa previous to going to Rwanda, so I had seen and knew and loved um, just the life beat that came from it. But that was probably one of the most surprising were those challenges. Now you touched a little bit on leading from below, but more specifically, how did you gain respect in these cultures, particularly as you mentioned, a male dominated culture. And let's be honest, you're 20 something blonde female from America coming in and trying to help. How did you navigate that? Yeah. So at first I made mistakes. And I think the first part is, is understanding and recognizing and owning your mistakes. So I came in, um, with the mindset to establish that I was confident and that I understood and knew what needed to happen. And that was after taking time to understand that I didn't walk right into the situation with that confidence, taking, you know, three weeks of really building trust and going out and understanding. And after that time, trying to establish it wasn't, successful. And so what it came down to were the results, to be really honest. Um, and also the lack of, um, um, owning everything. So not needing to take recognition that it was my own, but giving credit to um, other people in the team, regardless of whether I really accomplished it or not. It was a very interesting dynamic for me. Um, but I remember, um, our country director at the time that I went there to support, um, calling, you know, now my business partner, Greg, who was running the nonprofit then and saying, she's ruining everything. Those were his words. She has oh. ruined everything. And it was because I had gone to the village and understood that there was a different hierarchy going on. I had lived out there. I had stayed at this guest house with a translator, wanting to instill and ingrain myself in their culture and understand how these cooperatives functioned and if it really changed their lives and how they produce and get their materials and all of that. And after time, I saw some problems and I started to address them. And he didn't want to address them because it was upsetting to the women that we were going to go through a time of change and make sure that the controls were in place um, that was taking care of everyone down the line. And so um, having those comments made that she's ruining everything um, was really challenging and had, it, it took me a second to go back and reflect and say, how do I not ruin everything? But like also encourage him to realize that these results are necessary and that these results are fruitful and beneficial to the growth of the organization and his own position. 
What an amazing leadership learning opportunity right there. Because I'm assuming those skills that you learned and especially those first couple months are things that you've really held with you as you've created this company. Yes, definitely. And you know, I can't say that it didn't go without lots of conversations and coaching from um, Greg, who was leading the nonprofit at the time, the executive director. There were daily conversations with, you are driven, um, you know, I'm going to ask you to step back. I'm going to ask you to look out the window today. And so those conversations were really fundamental for my leadership at the time too. So it was that that piece of mentoring um, with taking advice from a leader who has had a little bit more experience, who has a 20-something thing going in and really wanting to make an impact and change. I was very passionate about, we need results. We're going to miss this opportunity. And so him being able to coach and guide and, um, and just tell me that it's the long road that we're taking and how to step back was really, really fundamental as well. Now let's touch on those results, especially several years later, as mentioned in the intro, you guys currently employ over 3000 individuals and then families. What are some other really great milestones that you've accomplished or some of the almost clouding points for all across Africa? Yeah. You know, I mean, I think that would be it is, um, when we do our impact studies, understanding that, um, an artisan on average supports 5.7 dependents. Um, so what that means is it's a community of 18,000 people who are directly impacted by income. That's not the ripple effect we're talking about. 18,000 people have, um, you know, improved nutrition, they have shelter, their kids are in school, they have access to healthcare, and we're working to teach them to save. 80% of our artisans actively use their savings account, which is significant for rural, uneducated farmers in um, East African countries that they have savings accounts and are utilizing them. So those are just some of them. I mean, there there are those mountaintop moments where we have our annual you know shareholder celebrations and we gather all of our artisans from um, distant areas and they come with shields and spears and poetry and songs and each cooperative's leadership gets up and presents and. Um, I wasn't there this last round, but Greg, my business partner was, and he called me afterwards almost in tears saying, they gave me this shield and this spear. And the shield, they said, is to protect. And the shield, the spear is to fight for their poverty. And he was like, it was such a powerful and distinguishing reminder that it is a daily fight, that business isn't just easy, that running this and leading this and that they recognize that and that we're working hard to fight for them. So you did a little bit, but you can you paint a picture of what your artisans look like and really drive home the type of impact that you're having with real individuals? Yeah, so um, this last trip that I was on, I went and visited an artisan's home named Seraphine. And Seraphine is a cooperative leader. So we were there at her home to meet other members of her uh, cooperative. I think she has uh, around 150 members. And so Seraphine introduced us to her husband who had just come in from the fields, a little bit embarrassed that he was still muddy and dirty from digging um, and quickly went back to change into his best clothing for his guests. And in the meantime, it was actually lunch and the children had arrived home from school. Um, She has nine children, four of which are um, in secondary school. So that means that they are at boarding school and other parts of Rwanda getting their secondary education. And the other children are in primary school. And so they came home in their uniforms and their books. Um, And we were there in her home and she said, look at this beautiful home. Like since I started weaving baskets with you guys, um, I was able to prove that I had money in the bank that I was saving and I was able to take out a loan and build this new house for my family. And she said, do you see that small house over there? That's where my husband and myself, my nine children and my mother-in-law all lived. And actually the roof had caved in on the house was all mud walls and the house that she was standing in now had concrete floor, concrete walls, a sturdy like tin roof. It was like seven times larger than what she was living in prior to. She had built a new house for her mother-in-law. She had three cows in her backyard, which is a significant amount of, you know, physical savings for her. And to see the neighbor kids coming up was actually the most pivotal, clearly the house in front of us, but her neighbor's And her kids in the community where she was um, the same, essentially, um, had ragged clothing and were not in school. And it 
it was heartbreaking to me sitting there and saying like, we're not doing enough. Like there are still these kids that aren't in school. There's still this woman that can't provide for her family. Um, but at the same time, knowing that like where Seraphine has come and where she is now is because of the work that we're doing and that there are thousands others that are in the same place. Like that is the powerful moment where I'm like, our work cannot cease. Like we have to continue. And there is like true results and impact here. And there are so many more to reach. And while it can be very discouraging that you're not impacting the whole continent or the world from, you know, every ounce of energy that you pour into it. Um, there, there does need to be defining moments like the times with Seraphine where you're proud and where I was like significantly proud of seeing Seraphine and the hard work and the pride that she had, um, in her work. And stories like Seraphine really bring to life the incredible impact that all across Africa has. Before jumping into the rapid fire, a quick resource and tool for you as you grow your business. One of the most challenging things out there can be around branding and marketing and really telling your story in a way that resonates with customers. To help, we've built a comprehensive ideal customer worksheet to help you walk through all the different steps in identifying your customer. Download your free copy at positiveimpactpodcast.com slash branding. Hang out with us there and you're also going to find information about a brand new branding guide for young businesses, all giving you the tools to make that positive impact in your business. And now for that rapid fire. Life is a balance of work, passion, and adventure. Can you tell us about a recent adventure or excursion you went on? I went to Catalina Island um, this past year for some R&R and didn't really know what to expect. Took the ferry over, ended up in a small town called Two Harbors in the off season. And it was an absolutely wonderful, rejuvenating adventure full of hiking and whale watching and seal chasing and was just like these quiet moments of just being outdoors and seeking something new that's still in my local backyard um, that was really wonderful. Many social entrepreneurs find solace and tranquility in the outdoors. How does that play into your role with All Across Africa? I would say that it's with regular runs um, here in San Diego. I um, live in Ocean Beach and I commonly take runs outside um, from the Pacific Northwest in Seattle. So I don't get to go hiking in the beautiful mountains anymore, but um, a run on the beach is definitely right up there. When hiking or on other outdoor excursions, what is one must have item that you always take with you? Oh gosh. Um, here in San Diego, it's sunglasses. I'm running with sunglasses regardless. Um, yeah. And otherwise it's just always a good pair of shoes. I'm always investing in, um, not necessarily like brand new or the best ton of shoes, but you got to have a good pair of shoes. Do you have a brand that you love? I don't. I, I commonly wear Asics, but I bounce around. I'm an Asics girl too. Can you describe a time, uh, where you had boots on the ground and you really got to see your impact come to life? Yeah, that would be um, after the first year of working. So we overcame the Macy's order, which I'd previously discussed, but um, packing a full container of baskets. So we had been working really hard both on the U.S. side to financially manage a container, and then the artisans were working really hard to fill a container. It was about 20,000 products all at once that needed to be shipped for Christmas. And um, it was at Thanksgiving time that the container arrived in the U.S., and I had to wait late at the office as they unpacked all of the boxes. And there was just this moment of like um, overwhelming joy that I had 550 boxes full of products that I had already seen produced and it arrived. It made it on time. We accomplished this feat together. It wasn't just us, but it was in partnership with the artisans. It was a really proud moment. Do you have a book that you recommend to other aspiring social entrepreneurs? Oh, gosh. Um you know, Simon Sinek, um, the book Why, has been a very, very powerful book. So not just in my business, but in my own personal life. So he talks a lot about how businesses need to position themselves and like why they do what they do, not what or how, but why. And he goes through examples like Apple and others who just talk about what they believe in. And that's been really fundamental for, you know, talking about why we do what we do instead of how. But even as a personal like um, entrepreneur saying like, why am I doing this? this? What am I looking to accomplish? Um, and why is that? And so continuing to ask the question why I love that book and recommend it all the time. What advice do you give for recent grads looking for meaningful careers? 
Oh, that is a can of worms for me. Um, So a lot of what I talk about is um, perseverance and hard work. So meaningful careers to me doesn't mean that you necessarily graduate from school and you enter into um, a job of changing the world. Um, For me, my journey to actually becoming um, a leader and an entrepreneur started with five years of really hard work at a law firm. And it took a long time. It was perseverance. I didn't love it. I didn't feel like I was bringing meaning, but I worked to bring meaning through about it. Um, getting everyone to volunteer at shelters monthly, creating budgets where we donated to other nonprofits, understanding leadership in the organization, understanding operations. And those lessons learned, that time, that hard work, that perseverance actually translated into me knowing and learning something and have paid off my student loans, um, where that I could go and volunteer and work and work for very little in a startup organization to be able to make an impact and take what I learned there. So college grads, don't be afraid of a real job. Don't be afraid of that hard work where you don't feel like you're immediately making an impact. If you have a goal and a focus and you're working towards that goal and that focus, um, it can be fruitful for the long term of making an impact. So empowering. Do you have a mantra or a motto that guides your work with all across Africa? Let's make a better world. There really is no better mantra than that, is there? (laughs) There's not. Let's make a better world. Alicia, today has been fantastic. Thank you so much for your time, your energy, and all your advice. So for people who are just in love with your mission and want to see the compelling and beautiful baskets that you guys create, one which you brought for me today and I'm just blown away by, how do they learn more? How do they get connected? Allacrossafrica.org. It'll have all the information on the organization, highlights artisans, and also has products for view and purchase. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, movers and shakers, I hope you're absolutely empowered by Alicia's incredible story to creating a global impact, particularly that huge takeaway of hard work and bringing meaning to a job that you might not define as meaningful, but building it into your everyday routine. Absolutely chilling. For all of the resources and links mentioned in today's episode, head on over to positiveimpactpodcast.com slash show. We're also going to have some incredible photos from Africa with their basket weavers and Alicia there on the ground. It's beyond powerful. If you're still grappling with what your why is, check out Simon Sinek's book, Start With Why, on our Goodreads page at positiveimpactpodcast.com slash goodreads. Hang out with us there and we'll give you a free audio download thanks to Audible. Until next time, keep doing your part to make the world a better place. <laughs>